because I'll need to advance my slides from, uh, from the computer here, but you might see me wandering, wandering out and I think I can get away, get away with it. I want to thank, first of all, Catherine especially, as well as the board of directors of the Turner Collection Manager, Adria Crossan, Kayla Lunt, a recent art history graduate and dedicated Turner volunteer, the seven humanities students who worked very hard to put together this exhibition, and all of you for coming tonight. Um, coming out for the reception as well as the talk for Inhabitable, the Sense of City. Now, as we're talking in part about the built environment, I think it's also appropriate and deeply exciting to note that the Janet Turner Print Museum will soon have a permanent home in the beautiful new Arts and Humanities building just outside, currently under construction, and slated to open in the fall of 2016. Uh, Dean Bob Knight can, I'm sure, talk to you after about the progress there, and it's really an exciting thing um, in general on campus, but especially for the Janet Turner Museum. It's going to be a lovely, larger space that will have a clear access point, not just on the university side, but also uh, for the community. So, um, one more view, a rendering of the lobby space uh, for the new building, where you can see in the background the recognizable uh, donors board of the Turner. So this is the, the current projection of what the lobby space will look like. And as you go out, you might just look right briefly and see that it's coming together really very quickly. So it's an exciting time for the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. Um, so when Catherine first approached me to help curate an exhibition with my students, I felt honored and then set about coming up with a theme for my Humanities Capstone Seminar that would also support a Turner exhibition. As you'll see when we walk over together to the museum, each print included in the exhibition is accompanied by a short essay, written by a primary writer, but then edited and added to by several others, reflecting the collaborative intentions of this show. For me, it has to be said, the most exciting part of the process was the very beginning. Being allowed to look through very, very carefully at much of the collection and seeing firsthand just how many different shows this collection can support. So if you aren't that familiar with the Turner, um, just let me briefly give an appeal. It is, it is a great resource that we have in Chico and specifically on this campus. Um, the idea of an exhibition on the city seemed like a natural way to connect the Turner's visual resources with the interests of the humanities program. I wanted to have a vehicle to enhance our discussions of the theoretical formulations of the city, emanating as far back as ancient Greece, but also to explore the ways in which the city continues to be anchored not just in our understanding of physical locations or of particular cities in particular times, but also as a powerful aspect of our imagining. Perhaps my own attraction to big cities is best explained by geography. I was raised in Reading and have lived in Chico since 2007. In both places, despite some clear differences, it is easy perhaps to take for granted accessibility to particularly stunning natural surroundings. In Chico, I can walk from my office on campus and reach Bidwell Park in about 15 minutes and make it to Upper Bidwell Park with not much more effort. And in Reading, the mountains form a part of pretty much any vista. My familiarity, my enjoyment, and my regular inhabitation of rural spaces maybe can account for the fact that when I travel, it is more often than not to a large city. Um, this, this longing, this is a print in the show, uh, that I think captures the sense of longing that when I haven't been to a big city for a while, I 
start to feel like, oh, when are we going to get to go again to New York or Chicago or London or Vienna, um, things like that. So it's something, it's something that I start to feel traditionally, oh, I don't know, in late April every, every year, um, if not at other times. Um, I have been regularly refreshed by city escapes. Whether taking a day trip, as I do often, to wander the neighborhoods of San Francisco, or further afield, trying and completely failing to buy groceries like a native in Paris. In an important articulation of uh, both the positive and negative impact of city life, the sociologist Lewis Worth worries that urban living could weaken what he calls bonds of kinship. He suggests that potentially urban dwelling might lead to a decline of the social significance of the family. And yet he also underscores, despite these concerns, that, quote, what is distinctively modern in our civilization is signaled by the growth of great cities. For worth, it is also potentially, um, it is also crucial that we acknowledge that cities are pervasive. He suggests here that the degree to which the contemporary world may be said to be urban is not fully or accurately measured by the proportion of the total popula population living in cities. Um, this suggests that for Worth and many other commentators, cities are often cultural melting pots, and his concern with maintaining distinctive cultural traditions, he fully acknowledges cities are also places likely to be locations of wider freedoms and toleration that can then emanate out and impact places other than what we might traditionally define as an urban environment. In my short remarks tonight, my intention is to touch on some of the themes related to the city many of which are layered into the context of the prints that you'll see at the Turner of this show, Inhabitable, and which we might usefully elaborate on either after I'm done here or certainly over at the museum slightly later. I will briefly reference a few of the prints in the show, but won't attempt to explicate them fully, as overall I would like the placement within the Turner space as well as the explanatory Esch space to get to do that work. Here we are briefly in Athens, in ancient Greece. Early discussions about the city are tied to the foundations of modern democratic governments, as well as understandings of civic virtue, justice, and community. The question of why we live together in close proximity and submit to a set of mostly agreed laws is one that has been answered differently, but always with an acknowledgement of the importance of the answer. Through Plato, we can glimpse Socrates' definition of a city as originating from many hope wants, and many persons are needed to supply them. One takes a helper for one purpose and another for another, and when these partners and helpers are gathered together in one habitation, the body of inhabitants is turned to city. Even when faced with execution, Socrates refuses to escape Athens, arguing against uh, the, the sort of suggestions of so many of his fellow 
contemporary sense of especially large cities, the ideal fit city that I'm talking about here, theorized by Plato, Aristotle, and others, was usually one where most citizens should have been able to recognize each other. And by citizens, we're not including women, children, <laughs> slaves, foreigners, but, you know, a particular group of men, it should be small enough where they should be able to maybe not know each other's names, but no, ah, yes, there, there's, a, there's a fellow citizen. Um, so this tension is, is something that really is in evidence very early on, already by the start of the Peloponnesian War, cities like Athens had grown well beyond the ability for its citizens to recognize each other by sight. So it, it's again suggesting already at near um, the beginning of where we have records, a tension between how we imagine or construct what, what we might think of as an ideal city and the actual physical place that we're existing in, that we're inhabiting and functioning in all types of different ways. From, to keep on the theoretical side for just another minute, from early modern England, Thomas More's Utopia offers us an imagined society which nevertheless reveals clear ties to the issues and environment of, of, his, of his own London and his own England. The cities of More's Utopia, there are 54 of them in total, and the Senate is placed in the city called Amaro that you can see in the middle. The idea is that it's not really that different from any of the other cities, except it's positioned in the middle, and so it makes sense to have government function from here. This is a version of civilization that's highly ordered. The cities of Utopia have people who are not given any individual right to property. The houses, more suggests, transfer owners every 10 years. So you beautify it to be a good person, but when you're working out in your garden, you know it's not actually yours. You're doing it for uh, the purpose of buying into the entire concept of utopia. Citizens in this world have mostly assigned trades. So this is a version of city life that, it should be said, is envisioned as one for most people. Um, and yet, it's highly unrelenting. Idleness is the enemy of efficiency and therefore the enemy of utopia. People are given mostly set roles that it's hard to, to get out of the job that, that you are told you should be doing. Um, you could, for instance, be given the job of making sure other people aren't being lazy in their jobs. That's, that's a pretty important one. Um, 